Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So I just have a couple of questions um, that just basically conduct science is mainly viewed by scientists who are entering the field and they love to hear more about prominent scientists in the field and sort of what they're doing and how they got to where they are. Um, so that just kind of context as to like the questions I'll be asking. And do you want long answers or short or does it matter? doesn't matter. Like whatever you prefer. Yeah. Um, so my first question is, why did you choose to enter the field of chemical and biomedical engineering? Well, chemical engineering, um, you know, boy, it's almost embarrassing to say. So, you know, in high school, I was good in math and science and not very good at anything else. So my dad and my guidance counselor said, well, you should major in engineering. And I really, I didn't even know what it was. But anyhow, I ended up going to Cornell. I majored in engineering. In my first year, I didn't do very well in most of the courses other than chemistry. And I didn't like the courses either. But you had to pick what you were going to be. And so since I was in the engineering school, I picked chemical engineering because it's the only thing I like. So that, that that's really how I ended up doing that. Um, it, but, you know, as I progressed, undergraduate, graduate school, and so forth, I still wasn't really sure about what I really wanted to do. I was interested in, I always thought biology was kind of interesting, even though I hadn't taken much of it. And, uh, but for a postdoc, I ended up, um, most of all my friends went to oil companies and I wasn't excited about that. And I was looking for something that I could do that I felt would help people. And I, looked into a lot of things. I ended up doing a postdoc, which was very unusual in 1974 for a chemical engineering, chemical engineer, because they got, you know, very good job offers in oil companies. But I got, uh, I ended up working in a surgery department at Boston Children's Hospital. I think I was the only engineer in the entire hospital. Um, and I got very, I, I, to me, it was almost being like a kid in a candy shop. I could see that engineering or chemical engineering might uh, offer possible solutions to a lot of things that I saw in medicine. So that's what got me into it was the postdoc that I did at uh, Boston Children's Hospital in Harvard. Oh, wow. That's super interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so along the path to where you are now, who would you say were your biggest mentors? Sure. Well, when I was little, I suppose my dad, you know, he'd play math games and and they, you know, my dad and my mom got me these like Gilbert sets, chemistry sets, erector sets, microscope sets, you know, but that was when I was really young. Um, later on, I mean, my biggest mentor was Judah Folkman. Now, he was the man that hired me at Boston Children's Hospital, and he was the surgeon in chief there. And he was a very visionary guy. And he was also somebody who had a lot of big ideas, and a lot of people told him they would never work. And he got criticized a lot, but I think that, and ultimately, of course, he was ended up being right. But I think seeing his example, and, and he was a, a wonderful person, that that uh, that was a great experience for me, and he was a great mentor. Sure, yeah, that's incredible. Thank you so much. Um, one specific question I have is, you are regarded as the founder of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. What inspired you to pursue this field, especially at a time when it was just uh, sort of beginning? Well, the way that started for me was actually when I worked in Dr. Folkman's lab, this goes back to the you know, early, mid 70s. Uh, one of the people I met there was a, another surgeon, Jay Vacanti, and he and I worked on this problem of uh, trying to stop blood vessels from growing. But when he got done, he became a transplant surgeon and ultimately head of the head of the liver transplant program at Boston Children's Hospital. And he and I were good friends and and he you know, would talk, we'd talk from time to time and he would be treating patients that were dying, of little babies of liver failure. And I remember he started talking to me, is there any way rather than do a transplant, that's what they would do then, still do. But he said, is there any way that maybe he and I could come up with a way to build organs from scratch uh, that could help children like this? And, and, and of course, more broadly help lots of people. So that that was because of him and and he and I started doing this, uh, you know, a, a long time ago, and that's kind of how we got started. Wow! Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I think you briefly mentioned this, but you developed the first angiogenesis inhibitor, that is the first drug to inhibit tumor growth via blood vessels, 
How did you kind of come up with the idea of creating a drug like this? And what was the process like of developing and testing this drug? Well, so Judah Folkman, who was the man I mentioned, the surgeon in chief, he had this broad idea of if you could stop blood vessels from growing, that might be a new way to treat cancer and other diseases. And, and people were very skeptical of that. So when he hired me in 1974, that's what he wanted me to prove, that that was, concept was even correct. And in so doing, isolate the first uh, blood vessel inhibitors. One of the key things to doing that was creating a, what we call a bioassay. There had been no really good way to study blood vessel growth. So one of the keys to that was developing tiny little particles, micro or nanoparticles that could deliver large molecules. And all the blood vessel inhibitors that we were thinking about possibly studying were large molecules like peptides, proteins, nucleic acids, and so forth. So at any rate, um, you know, that, so I spent a lot of time trying to do that. Eventually we were successful. And in 1976, we published two papers, one in nature, which was the first nano or microparticles that could ever deliver large molecules, including nucleic acids. And then we used that, uh, that system where we could put it in like a ISA or an egg ASA to, to deliver these large molecules. And I'd isolated maybe over a hundred fractions. And we showed that you could stop blood vessels from growing that way. Now, this was just a, these were scientific studies. It took, would take many, many years before they would become real live drugs or, or drug delivery systems that would help patients. But eventually they did. Yeah. And so what was the sort of time like length between this idea and then the official implementation in patients? How long did it take? Yeah, a long time. So the science paper on the first angiogenesis inhibitor was 1976. It took um, took 28 years before the first one ever would get approved, and that was great work by people at Genentech like Napoleon Farrar, and you know, cost would cost billions of dollars of, of research and money and clinical trials by them. On the drug delivery systems, uh, we had a relationship with Takeda, uh, where you know they would come to the lab and. I think they are the first uh, drug delivery system that could at least release a large molecule was Lupron Depot, and that came out in 1989. So that was 13 years later. But of course, even tinier particles, that, that would take longer. And of course, the big impact most recently comes from another company I helped start, Moderna, you know, where you'd use different nanoparticles. Again, so a lot of times the compositions are changed and so forth. But uh, of course, those nanoparticles have used, been used for the vaccines all over the world. Sure, yeah. And sort of building off of this, you mentioned a couple of companies. Um, you are like the founder of many companies. What sort of prompted you to sort of get involved in this industry? And who were your mentors and supporters along the way? Yeah, so, well, what what happened was I you know, I wanted to see, I was very naive. I wanted to see the things I did in the lab get used. And I was, like I say, naive. So I, we published the stuff. We published it and were fortunate enough to get it in good journals uh, like Science and Nature. But I thought people would just use it. Um, and I don't mean just academically. I mean, they, academically, it, what was starting to be used and the work was certainly cited a lot. But I wanted it to help patients and you know, for 10 years, nobody seemed to care. Uh, but finally, a couple of large companies did, and they gave me, you know, grants and uh, consulting fees, and they started to work on it. But then they just gave up. So one of my good friends, Alex Klebanoff, he's a professor at MIT at the time, he's uh, emeritus now, said, Bob, we should start our own company. So we did. And uh, that, you know, we did, except four of my students worked there. And you know, that it had its ups and downs, but ultimately they, they did quite well. And, you know, that company is like Alchemy's today, or at least part of it. And, you know, and, and they've got all kinds of different um, microspheres um, that can deliver different molecules to treat diseases, like to prevent opioid addiction, to treat diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, uh, schizophrenia and others. So, um, but that's how it got started. And then I just kept doing it. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing including, that. Including with, including with your father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, sort of like talking about AI, um, it's obviously be been becoming an even bigger technology recently. 
Where do you see the use of AI in chemical and biomedical engineering? Well, I think AI is very important, but I also think it's it's hyped to a large degree. I mean, to do it, you really need to do it right. And I'm not speaking as an AI expert. I'm not, but I, I've talked to plenty of people who are. You know, you need really good data sets that you can compare against each other. In other words, a lot of people just think you can take literature data and compare one paper and another and you'll, you know, all of a sudden get an answer and you won't, or at least it won't be very good. But I think if you have large data sets where every single thing is done the same way, very high purity and everything else, well, then you can draw some conclusions about different things. And I think it has a lot of potential in uh, in, in, in many areas in drug, drug development, diagnosis and so forth. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I guess my next question for you is what are you currently working on in the lab and sort of what are your next goals in terms of what you want to accomplish in the lab? We have probably have over 100 people working in the lab. A lot, I'd say a lot of it's involved in better drug delivery systems. We're doing a tremendous amount with the Gates Foundation, you know, to try to create uh, new medicines and new delivery systems for the developing world, for example. Uh, and they'll be useful, I think, for our world, too. But but just to give some examples, I mean, a lot of people are malnourished and we in, and, and they don't get enough vitamin A or, or iron. Uh, and, and part of the problem is that, uh, you know, when they put it in different um, things that they eat, like bouillon or something, they get destroyed. And we've come up, uh, Anna Jacqueline in our lab and her team, uh, you know, we've come up with ways to... Uh, encapsulate that and, and all these different nutrients and uh, in a way that they don't degrade. And yet when they get eaten, uh, they'll, they'll still come out 100%. Um, also vaccination. I mean, right now, everybody has to get vaccinated many, many times. But in the developing world, you know, getting boosters and so forth. In the developing world, people don't come back that often. In fact, they're not doing such a good job in our country either. But um, we so we've come up with a way of giving a single injection and it's what we call a self-boosting vaccine. So one injection, you know, can actually give you the equivalent of, say, 12 injections over a period of time. So you wouldn't have to come back. We're also working on pills that right now, if you ever took a pill, it wouldn't last for more than a day. But we've come up with a way to make them last uh, for two weeks or a month or longer. This has been done by. Gio Traverso, who's a fellow with me and now professor at MIT and, 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 and some of the people he and I work with. Uh, we, what, we're also working on lots of other things uh, in, in uh, drug delivery. Um, we're working on use new kinds of nanoparticles for uh, different types of genetic therapy, whether it be CRISPR or RNA or other things like that. We're working uh, also a lot on tissue engineering uh, including organs and tissues on a chip, which could greatly reduce uh, animal testing and, and human testing. And examples of that are a GI tract on a chip. Alice Stanton in our lab, we're working with Li Wei Tsai. She's actually made this incredible brain on a chip. Uh, and then there are, are real life tissues that we've been working on, like you know artificial pancreas and uh, other things like that. So there are really a, a, a large number of projects in the lab. And of course, my next goal after, as we make progress on these, are to, again, get them to patients or get them to help in drug development and things like that. Yeah, that's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm excited to see where all of this goes. Um, what do you think the U.S. needs currently in terms of staying competitive in science and medicine? Well, I think funding for basic research is, is a, there's a number of things that are important. But funding for basic research is, 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 I think, one thing that's very important. I also think, um, you know, there's been talk about, in certain cases, you know, giving patents up or weakening the patent system. You know, I think that's a terrible idea. I think, you know, really, Abraham Lincoln uh, actually said the patent system, who was a, our 16th president, you know, actually made the point that the three most important things in, of the three most important things in history, the patent system was one of them. And that's part of what made the United States great. So I think weakening the patent system or giving patents up, you know, which has been suggested, hasn't happened yet, but it's been suggested. And uh, I think, you know, you, uh, to me, that's the last thing you want to do. Also, I mean, there are 
you know, I, th I think there's a lot of things that are going on, you know, where about price controls, about criticizing companies for charging. And I think the intentions on that, I understand people's intentions and politicians' intentions on that. But I think that they just simply don't understand, you know, that like uh, they make an argument, well, it doesn't cost very much to manufacture a drug. Well, that may may or may not be true, but it costs billions, as Tufts has pointed out many times, to get that drug through the clinic and get it used. Similarly, I think what they don't realize is that investors, you know, a lot of times they say, well, the United States paid for everything. Well, it, it may have paid for a little bit, but it's really investors. You know, that's a capitalistic system that that pay, that really paid for most of these companies, the venture capital and and other investors and so forth. So investors have a choice, right? They could want to invest in the next Facebook, um, which is not capital intensive, or they could invest in the next Moderna. So, I mean, my personal feeling is I'd rather see more Modernas, you know, creating medicines that'll save the world than more Facebooks. Nonetheless, there's a lot of politicians that are talking about laws that will clearly favor the, the new Facebooks and, and, and make sure investors don't fund things that'll save people's lives. So, so, so those are some of the things that I think could make a difference. Sure, yeah. No, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I guess one of my questions is like, it's kind of more broad, but what has being a scientist taught you? Like not just related to science, but related to really anything in your life? Well, I think being a scientist, I hope makes you want to make decisions based on science. I mean, just to pick an example, when I was chair of the FDA science board, that was their highest advisory board. I was chair of it for a number of years. This was over 20 years ago. But, you know, you can make medical decisions based on politics, based on religion, or based on science. And I think yeah, always, in my opinion, you, you want to make them on science if, it's, if it affects a, a lot of things. So I think the more you make science-based decisions be using facts, rather than making things up or, you know, or, or, or you know, and, and so forth. I think that's just really important. Sure. And how do you think we can also make, I guess, scientific information more accessible to the public? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And, and you know, I think there's a saying that people have made that a society gets what it celebrates. You know, our country, you know, some countries, actually, India, for example, I mean, I'll just give you an example. You know, when I won the National Medal of Science, that's like supposed to be the highest honor in the United States, scientific honor. And I was getting, this is quite a number of years ago, but it would be even more true today. You know, I remember getting calls from people that, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, from India or Tibet or lots of, you know, that it was in the front page of some of their newspapers. In the United States, nobody cares. You know, and but if you're an athlete or a singer or a movie star, you know, that 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 gets a lot of attention or, or something really bad happens, you know, a big bad murder. Um, so I think that that the news media probably could be helpful. On the other hand, I understand the predicament. They want to sell newspapers and sell stories. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, it's 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 challenging. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um what advice do you have for scientists who are sort of just starting their career in science? Well, I think if you're just, I think it depends what stage, you know, if you're a, a undergraduate, I think, the, and maybe even a graduate student, the most important thing to me is to understand fundamentals, you know, really get a good grasp of fundamentals uh, of science, the basics. If you're starting a career in, in industry, I think you want to pick something that you're passionate about. And I'd say that's also true in academics. So whatever you do, pick something that's, that you're passionate about and where you feel you can make a big impact. Sure, yeah. And, and, don't, and don't be afraid to fail. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that completely makes sense. From, you know, when you started like undergrad, what do you think you learned most then that you use now in your day-to-day -day job? Well, I think the fundamentals actually, you know, and also maybe how to think critically, scientifically. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's actually it for my questions. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. <laughs> my pleasure. Good good luck with everything. And <laughs>